Good morning. I'm Arthur Herman, Senior Fellow at Hudson Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you to Hudson Institute's first ever conference on the coming quantum computing revolution. You know, Bob Noyce, co-founder of Intel, used to say that if the automobile industry had followed the same innovation curve that the semiconductor industry had followed, that your brand new Cadillac would cost you $5, could drive across the country on one gallon of gas, and when you got to your destination, you wouldn't have to look for a parking place because you could fold it up, fold your Cadillac up and put it in your pocket. Well, we can imagine, now that's what Noyce was saying in the mid-1980s. You can imagine what he would be saying about all the things that have happened in the information technology industry in the last 30 years. Well, what we're going to be talking about today, and our four panelists as well as our distinguished keynote speaker, and also our very distinguished introductory speaker, what we're going to be talking about is going to put that revolution in which, as you'll see, so many of the panelists are going to talk about it as what we use today as classical computers, but the revolution that we're going to talk about is going to put classical computers in the shade, that they're going to look like not just the 1985 Cadillac, but the 1955 Cadillac in the course of what's coming and the changes that are going to take place. But the quantum computing revolution, what we're going to be talking about today, involves not just a major transformation of the information technology based upon a whole new revolutionary set of of physical properties and principles, but it's also going to represent a major revolution in the area of cybersecurity. It's going to represent a major revolution in the area of how we think about national security. Uh, and indeed the impact that it's going to have on all of our institutions, both in the public and the private sector, uh, is almost immeasurable at this point. Um, That the changes that we're going to be talking about today, changes that make some of them coming as soon as a decade or even less, uh, are going to be ones that are going to fundamentally reshape, reshape the nation's economy, our national security, and our international relations as well. And given the timeline that's involved, this is the time, this is the place to start talking about what's going to happen, where we're headed, what changes are coming, how we prepare for them, and how we look forward both to the challenges but also to the opportunities that this quantum revolution is going to represent. So I'm very pleased to welcome you and to welcome our very distinguished uh, expert panelists who are all going to be talking about this subject and are going going to provide, I promise you, a very fascinating and informative day. But probably the best place to start for a discussion like this is to answer the simple question, what is a quantum computer? And what does quantum... Uh, the, and quantum mechanics have to do with the changes that are going to be coming in the information technology sector. Well, this is part of the issue that we're going to have to address from the very beginning, is, is that the quantum computers and the very principles on which they're based remain very murky in the eyes of the general public, in the eyes of policymakers, and even in the eyes of many people in the information technology industry. This is one of the things that I found so fascinating as I got involved with this, was the degree to which the people whose livelihoods depend upon information technology are in many cases rather, I won't say blissfully unaware, but certainly are not as involved and not as up to speed on what is going to be happening in the next decade or more uh, in their own fields and, and the transformations that are coming here. So the question then is, how do we understand, how, how do we look at this very complicated, I would even say esoteric, uh, set of principles on which quantum computing is going to be based and quantum ca- cybersecurity? How do we make sense of it for people who aren't 
scientists who aren't physicists and who aren't already involved in the engineering issues and the engineering questions that quantum computing and quantum cybersecurity are going to represent. Well, the person that we thought would be perfect to talk about this is going to be our first speaker, and that's Dr. Warner Miller. Dr. Miller is one of the legends in the field of quantum computing. He's professor and chair of the physics department at Florida Atlantic University. He also has an emeritus position at the Air Force Research Laboratory in New Mexico since he retired from the Air Force in 2009. Dr. Miller got his degree, Ph.D., in physics in 1986 under the supervision of another legend, John Archibald Wheeler at the University of Texas in Austin. His dissertation in general relativity introduced null strut reggae calculus. I assume I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's not something that we talk about very much around the dinner table at home, but it is something that I assure you gives the kind of grounding and expertise that Dr. Miller brings to this overall subject. Before he came to Florida Atlantic University in 2003, he worked at Los Alamos as a J. Robert Oppenheimer Fellow in 1990, then moved to become a technical staff member in 1993, and was group leader for T6 for six years from 1996 to 2002. His interests and his background and his research include areas such as general relativity, discrete geometry, reggae calculus, quantum information geometry, and quantum gravity. And when my assistant, Ms. Friedson, and I were thinking about who would be the perfect person to introduce a lay audience or provide an introduction to quantum computing and to the principles underlying it, to give us a crash course in quantum 101, we both agreed that Dr. Miller was the perfect candidate. And so it's with great pleasure and with great anticipation that I introduce to you Dr. Warner Miller. Good morning. Mic working okay? I can hear myself. How many of you in the audience here understand the quantum in some way or another? Okay, good. So I can go right into the advanced graduate version of the talk. So I want to thank the Hudson Institute for putting this together. It's very timely. Walking down Pennsylvania Avenue and coming into a building so close to the center of everything and seeing on the board the word quantum warms my heart. So I've been given the task today of introducing some concepts in quantum computing and quantum cryptography in 20 minutes. I'll start the two-semester course right now, and we'll see how far we get. But I thought I'd break it up into three areas. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's special about quantum to me. Through the eyes that I've learned from John Wheeler and with the excitement and introduction to quantum computing that I've seen with Richard Feynman in a few talks. So these are sort of the three stages of the talk. I can't really do a good job at this because what Niels Bohr has said here, as I have on the slide, if anyone says that they can think about quantum physics without coming dizzy, that shows only that they do not understand anything whatsoever about the quantum. So good. So if you don't understand me, either probably not me not giving a good talk, it's just the quantum itself. I'll blame it on that. And I'll try not to express myself more clearly than I think, taking that as a guiding principle. So where to start? Well, where to start is when 20 minutes is the most dramatic example that I know of, of the elementary quantum phenomena. So bear with me. And in light of the recent neutron star collision discovery of LIGO, I thought it was appropriate to put an interferometer up here. And by the way, those stars, the neutron stars that collided, all that goes back in its very foundations to elementary quantum phenomena too, across the universe. So what we're talking about is a fundamental law of nature. It's about, it's fundamental to everything around us, this podium, the stars, the quantum computers that we'll be talking about. So I have here an interferometer in the top portion. 
And you send a photon or a neutron in. They both behave like waves uh, in, in some ways, uh, wave mechanics. And you, you put uh, the, the neutron, it's labeled one, into a beam splitter. So, and what is that? It's a half silver mirror for photons, or it could be a, a thin piece of material for neutrons, so that half the light goes through on the lower arm of the interferometer, and half goes in the upper arm of the interferometer. So we split the beam of light. We reflect them and bring them back together. Now you can imagine this could be very large. The neutrons could be going slow. We put them in the laboratory, going about as fast as you can run, 2,000 angstrom uh, neutrons. But, um, but uh, you, and you bring them back together. Now, not so surprising, if you, um, if you tune the interferometer perfectly, then you put another beam splitter in there at the lower right hand, then all of the laser light, for example, will go into one detector and not in the other. All those photons, those coherent photons. Um, if, on the other hand, you, you leave that beam splitter out, then all this light floods into either one of the detectors. So this is very simple. It's a constructive or destructive interference in the case of the lower right. You can think of it as a wave-like property. Um, Maxwell's theory, classical theory. And which root, on the lower left, you can think of them as particles. The photon was reflected and went to the upper root, or the photon was transmitted and went in the lower root. Now, let's go to quantum. Okay, let's reduce the beam intensity down to a single photon. Okay, so we send a single photon into this interferometer. It travels. It's the beam splitter. It travels, and at the very last minute, we wait and we wait. I know photons go fast, but bear with me. Pretend like we're waiting. We wait. They must have hit those mirrors already. We wait even longer. And then right at the last minute, we decide whether or not, willy-nilly, random number generator, whatever you wish, whether we put the beam splitter in or take the beam splitter out. Well, when we do this in a quantum experiment with a single photon, how can this be? The photon is in the upper root and lower root if we have the beam splitter in, or the photon is a particle which goes um, in both roots if you interfere, and one root or the other if you don't. And what's amazing is with a single photon, one at a time, it reproduces the same results. Now, you should think about that. I'm spending more time on this than I should, but I think this is important because this is the quintessential uh, realization from Niels Bohr that I know of, of delayed choice uh, of, of the elementary quantum phenomena. Now, so you put that in, and it exhibits wave-like character. You take it out, it's particle. So Niels Bohr gave this lecture, and a professor came up to him after the lecture, and he says, what does it mean to be, for the photon to be in the upper arm of that interferometer, or lower arm, or to be in both? What does it mean to be in, those, in that upper arm, or particle, or wave? And then you, you sit back and you, you see Bohr's answer. He says, the classic Bohr style, to be, to be, what does it mean to be? What is existence? And quantum changes our perception of this, and it changes it in this example. And it changes it in, 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 in drastic ways. Single particle, you make it realization as if it behaves like a particle or a wave, depending on your last minute decision, when it's already through most of the inner interferometer. So what Wheeler has uh, captured in the right is this great smoky dragging. I wondered why I put that on the slide here. We have no right to ascribe a reality to anything but how we prepared the initial photon going into this interferometer or quantum computer. And we have, we have, we have, we have only the right to say how it was prepared, no right to say anything about what its state is inside the interferometer. And, but we can say when the detector goes off. So we can talk about the tail, the sharp tail, and the sharp teeth of the great smoky dragon. The smoke hides everything else in between. And this is, to me, this is the essence of, of the elementary quantum phenomena. And as uh, uh, Bohr and, and Wheeler uh, would emphasize that no elementary quantum phenomena is a phenomena until it is brought to a close by an irreversible act of amplification. 
That is bringing the quantum into digits, into bits, into bits. So you go from this quantum phenomena, you measure it, and you get bits, get information out. And information is physical. Ralph Landauer has told us this, among others. So as I said before, this could be done in principle, in one's mind's eye, on a cosmic scale. So the, the quantum you think is small, atomic, but this phenomena can, can reach across vast reaches, a Z of 1.6, or very early universe, very distant uh, galaxy. Here's from January 2017, one of the best uh, lensing um, from a quasar um, that is known. You see the four images there. Those are not four distinct quasars. Those are the same quasar. They're lensed by an intervening galaxy. So you can imagine picking the photons out of those four things, traveling across the universe for so long, and only at the last minute deciding whether to put the beam splitter in or out. And you ascribe a different reality once you make the measurement to what nature appears to you to be. Okay, so that's a... Uh, so what quantum mechanics is telling us and, uh, is that uh, no longer in all the classical physics that we've had, no longer are we just observers behind a plexiglass screen observing in, in, in nature, doing its wonderful, magical things. We are, in a sense, breaking through this glass, and we are participators. We are making decisions of what measurements we make. In quantum computing, we are de deciding what detectors we put in at the output of gates or unitary operations or on the other end of a quantum computer. We make those decisions. We elicit the algorithms. So, and Wheeler uh, emphasized the universal, uh, universal size of this by having this U representing the universe and the eyeball us looking at the early reaches of the universe. So we are now, our quantum mechanics says we are observer participants participants in nature. So this quantum, we talk about quantum states. We'll be talking about quantum states uh, today quite a bit. So we have this, this psi, this Greek symbol up here with a, with a bracket that's uh, in, introduced by Dirac, and that's the note a vector, a state vector, a quantum state. Uh, that has properties of being um, very unique in any theory of nature that we've seen so far. It requires a complex number, a square root of minus one. No other theory in physics requires that. It's just the convenience. But in quantum mechanics, there is no way to get rid of the square root of minus one. It's a unique feature. And it appears up here in the phase, e to the i phi. And all the states we prepare for quantum computing are going to have these complicated phase relationships. And this complex nature is not something we can get rid of. It's inherent to it. Where does it come from? Well, Wheeler always tried to go back and say, how come the quantum? Can we derive it from deeper principles? So uh, he, he pointed out the work of uh, Stuckelberg and Fisher. Well, he said it's a complex probability amplitude. Why amplitude and why not probability? That's because the population geneticists, R.A. Fisher, showed us that distinguishability, determining yes or no, the outcome of the quantum experiment, the, outcome, uh, the output of the quantum computer, is a probability amplitude, and we have to square the wave function in order to get a probability. Stuckelberg told us that this principle of complementarity that I showed you in the interferometer, this is it a particle, or is it a wave, or is it both? Or can we say anything about it? That demands that we have a, a, um, the uh, complex numbers in the theory. So we're already seeing where things come from on a very deep level. And the picture here is of Bohr and Einstein, perhaps some of the deepest conversations in uh, humanity for a long, long time, maybe even back to antiquity. So let's get to the nitty gritty. What is a bit? What is a qubit? So I have here, uh, I'll apply things in this talk just to photons. And they have, you wear polarizers and you block the light coming in that reflects off of glass and lens and water and so forth. So uh, you have horizontal and vertical polarized light. Well, in normal computers, this, the silicon, the chip, CMOS, you have just a zero or a one. You have a voltage or you don't have a voltage. It's on or off. So you have just a bit of information, a zero and one. And, and uh, 
In quantum mechanics, the state function, this psi, this bracket, is in a simultaneous uh, superposition of a one and a zero, vertical and horizontal. So unlike the classical bit, the quantum bit reveals itself in both states at once, simultaneously. So two for one in this particular qubit. And these alphas are probability amplitudes. You can call it vertical, horizontal, or one and zero, just like you do with, with, with uh, computers. And how much time? You okay? Okay, great. So, uh, so anyway, so I, I talked here about the qubit. This is called a Stokes sphere over here, and I'll go and point here. And on the different axes is the diagonal, vertical, and circular polarized light. And anywhere in between, we'll have elliptic polarization. But all the points on the sphere, except for on the axes, are, are, are mixtures or superpositions of vertical and horizontal polarization. So when you have a qubit, you are exploring the whole space. Um, you are in superposition state. You're able to, to, to have the quantum state be in, in both a 0 and a 1 simultaneously, very bizarre coin if you want to think of it that way with heads and tails. So why does this give us advantage in quantum computing? Well, you get two for one. You get two squared for two. Two cubed for three qubits. So you start getting all these possibilities adding up. So I show you three. So imagine you have three quantum states, three qubits here. Well, they can be arranged as three ones, two ones and a zero, and so forth in all these different orders. So three qubits already give rise to eight, two to the three combinations. You look at the, the, uh, this, this diagram here and this, this table here. So this is classical memory. And 64 kilobytes, well, when you start exponentiating in this way with superposition, you get uh, it's just 10 quantum bits give you the 64 kilobytes. 20, you're up to 64 megabytes. You're blowing through classical computing very quickly. 64 gigabytes, so it's pretty impressive not too long ago. 30 qubits, 30 photons. You get up to 64 exabytes. This is beyond petabytes. This is what one of the challenges that we're facing. You're at, you're at 60 qubits, just 60 qubits. Okay? And then quantum supremacy, when, when quantum computers surpass our ability currently to do classical computing, and maybe for a long time, you're at, say, 51 um, qubits, 50 qubits. So this is the power of, of quantum computing is in the superposition of states. It can feel all the possibilities at once. It's in a superposition state, simultaneously in all these different states, whereas classical bits are just one and zero. They're a Cartesian product when you add them up. The energy requirements are high, because in classical, if you want to do the same thing, you need for an energy gap in your, in your CMOS or something, you need all those bits times that energy gap. Here in quantum, you're going to need 64 egg, uh, exabytes for a classical, but for a quantum, you need just 60 energy units. Now, I'm simplifying things, and people will tell me how more complicated things are, but this is the essence. And then we'll hear today about entanglement between quantum systems. Unlike classical systems, classical systems have no entanglement, have no superposition. You don't get this exponential scaling. They also have Cartesian products between the two. Now, if I take a coin and cut along its edge, and then I put them in two separate envelopes, one and two, without the labels on them anymore, and then I mix them up and send them out to two people in this room, or send them across the Earth, or send them out as far as I can away, Say I send it to Alice and Bob. You'll hear that those two characters today, possibly. If you do this and you open those envelopes, it's not so surprising. This is classical physics. You will see if Alice gets a heads, she will know perfectly that Bob will get tails. And if Bob gets heads, Alice will have tails. Okay, they're perfectly anti-correlated, perfectly as strong a correlation as you can get. Can you imagine something correlated even more? Well, if you entangled these quantum bits into two photons, or two electrons, as I show here, they're not just entangled, they're not just correlated in just 
heads and tails or spin up and spin down in the Z direction. They're entangled in spin X and spin Y or spin, spin uh, uh, X and X and plus X minus X plus Y minus Y or vertical horizontal polarization, left and right diagonal or right and left circular. So the correlation in a quantum system is even stronger than classical. This allows us to pull the information tighter in correlation than we could otherwise do and build algorithms of unprecedented strength. So here's an example of an entangled state with a 0, 0, and a 1, 1. There is no way that I can write that as a product, simple product of two states. So, and this is what we mean by being entangled. You cannot do this in classical physics. And this power of this entanglement, this super correlation, is something that enables us to do amazing things with quantum computing. So let me get to the, the gist of things, the conventional versus quantum computing. And I, and I pointed this out earlier. You have um, many distinguishable classical inputs into the classical computer on the left. And then you have an output of that computation. And if you want to do a big problem, let's say simulate a quantum gate with 45 um, photons. That's well, going to take you a half of a petabyte to do, and that was done recently. So a half a petabyte to do just 45 photons. What if I wanted to simulate something with 60? And these gates can do amazing things. Well, the classical computer can't do that. On a quantum computer, though, as you can see, the input of that quantum computer is a superposition state. And that has all the different possibilities. And that scales up exponentially. So 60 photons going into this quantum computer, amazing things you can't imagine that you can do with anything else. So, um, so this gives, gives you a, 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 a glimpse of things. So the, the, uh, the classical computer, you can scale that up so you can run, it scales exponentially in years for bigger problems. And quantum, it, it scales up with exponentially number of qubits. So you can, it's, it's not the years, it's not the time. You just increase the number of qubits, and that gives you the exponential scaling in and by itself. So why is this important? Why are we here today? Well, Moore's law says roughly every couple of years you double the number of transistors on your circuit. And that has been that red curve on the top has been tried and true for a long time. Except there's this thing called Denard's Law, which was in 1974, Denard published a paper, and said that you know, the power density in these chips are constant. And that scaling worked very well for a long time. You can see the typical power in watts you can push through in the, uh, the, the lower curve here. And, um, and that started flattening off. You had dead silicon, dark silicon. Because what happened was we're making these, these miniature, miniaturized, miniaturized. We're getting down to the quantum limits, close to them, within a couple hundred, hundred factors. You start getting leakage of current, of electrons, that heats up the chip. You got to put more transistors on the chip. You need to have more cores. So you see the black line, the cores are starting to increase. But this deviation from Denard's law is really showing us it was correlated for a long time, and now it's starting to crack. And, and you're gonna, this is going to signal a need that you can't do business as usual anymore. And if you control the understanding of information and communication and secure it, this is where future national security relies on that. And we're already seeing warning signs. This is a big warning sign. Complicated graph, a lot of data, but a big warning sign. So what is a quantum computer? Well, you have to somehow build something that's scalable. You have to take advantage of these two to the n states. Now, I read this, I was gonna teach a quantum class. I actually built a couple uh, holographic quantum gates in linear optical computing. And I realized very quickly how important each of these bullets are. So uh, I patented it, nice, nice optical device, good for some uses. Quantum computing, not so much, because I didn't have scalability in there. I required exponentially more inputs into the hologram. And who wants to put an exabyte of interference into a hologram? It's not going to work. Okay, so we need scalability. We need to initialize a state coming in. 
And we need to make sure that there's, that when it's in a room heated or you try to cool it down and there's thermal noise and so forth, you want to make sure that these states and all these phases and all the relationships, this E to the I phi I told you about, they're all coherent. They all stay in tune and in step with one another. Well, there's something called decoherence and it has a time scale. So you want to keep your, your quantum computer running and doing computations on a time scale less than that decoherence. Or you've got to correct for those errors. It's quantum error correction. Okay? And I'll get to that in a second. You need a universal set of gate operations. We have that on a classical computer. We have those on a quantum computer. We have quantum gates that manipulate these qubits and have a universal set. And we need a specific measurement, uh, qubit specific measurement capability. And I re remember Feynman on the stage in Santa Barbara giving a talk. And he would say, well, he said, we put in these uh, qubits into the quantum computer and they go calculating away. And they come out to the output, oh, so they decide to go this way, and then this way, and this way, because this is the great smoky dragon. And then eventually we get output, we measure the output. It was bizarre, but uh, the idea is, is we can't sort of talk about the state yet comes in and goes out. Yes, yes. And, and, uh, and, and uh, so, so we, we need some, some measurement, and the gates are sort of interesting because you know that in classical physics you have C-naught gates, controlled knots. You can look at the output of one gate and decide what another pair of photons, what operations you do on it. And this, these conditional measurements in many cases can be pushed off to the end of the computation. So all you have is one big non-conditional measurement on a circuit model. So everything is sloshing around inside there in some state, wave or particle and so forth. And you get measurements out and you decide what conditional measurements you do out to enlist the algorithm. This makes it hard. So what algorithms can we build on computers, quantum computers? How do we think about this? Do we put the conditional measurements inside? Do we take them outside? These are the kind of things that are very difficult. And we have at NIST with Lily, the, we have the, the quantum algorithm zoo. And, uh, and, and, uh, and we have, you know, various other things that we'll hear about today with uh, the quantum test bed uh, at, at the Office of Science. But uh, we have a lot of, lot of interesting things that we have. But the input scales exponentially in a perfect world. So this, I put this on here because how do you build these bits? How do you realize these bits? Ones and zeros are fine. I told you about photon polarization. We can get our hand around that. We deal with that with our polarizers, our, uh, our glasses, polarized lenses. But the currently, the, 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 uh, a, a few of the uh, interesting areas, and this is a pretty old slide for quantum computing, by the way, 2013. It's very outdated. This is a historic <laughs> document, I think, in this field. It just gives you the idea of the urgency we have to get on top of things. But we have ion, we have ion traps where we, we, we keep the, the spins and, and ions trapped and we can entangle them and, and pull them together and make sure they, they have this, this entanglement property and they're all communicating with each other. They're a network, they're a complex quantum network. We also have superinducting. We have uh, D-Wave. Uh, we have people here. Um, superinducting circuit and, and so forth. So which deal with magnetic flux. We can bring down the flux in a super single loop where you have one quantum of flux. You can break that loop in two and put it on top of each other. What does that superposition tell you? So um, does it, it doesn't behave classically. We have wonderful machines that are being built. We have topological quantum computing. We have cold atoms. There are a lot of ways to represent the, physically these logical bits and how, how much fidelity can we do with that. So currently today, we'll talk, you'll hear a little bit about different levels of, of, of quantum information processing. We have annealing, which we try to minimize some giant optimization problem and have the quantum phenomena of tunneling through barriers. They can actually get to the minimum energy or close to the minimum energy by tunneling. You can have partial qubit control and maybe do quantum simulation, where you have things tied together in some of the qubits and so forth. They're tied together also in the, in the D-wave as well. Um, or you can have the universal quantum computing, perhaps one of the biggest breakthroughs 
is that the, the, uh, the universal quantum computing quantum dynamics is modeled by a universal quantum computational scheme. David Deutsch gave us. But you need full control of every qubit. You don't want to be limited by these decoherence times. So Peter Shore showed us great algorithms for breaking RSA, factorizing large primes. A little bit of quantum computing and a little bit of high mathematics, abstract algebra. But with a combination there, you can do great things. But we need to talk about quantum error correction and fault-tolerant quantum computing. This is the goal of where we want to go, possibly. And the, the panels will make that clearer today. And I'm almost done here. So there's this border territory here between classical world and quantum world. And you can see that uh, later on. But this is a diagram from Zurich a while ago. And it talks about these interference and so forth, and this irreversibility and classical world that we live in. And I didn't want to give too many equations, but I had I, I can't help myself, and I partook in the equations. So sorry about that. So, but the the diagram here is a, a typical quantum state with these correlations in the lower left, with the with the the uh, uh, purple. Um, bumps in, in indicating the interference terms, these phase terms. If you sit this quantum particle in a heat bath of vibrating molecules or vibrating harmonic oscillators, then very quickly in this time scale here, you see that all that interference, all the power of quantum computing disappear. So this is why you want to be able to correct those errors. In classical physics, you have redundancy. In quantum, in quantum physics, you have the ability to know there's an error and to correct the error. But it takes entanglement, and it takes uh, you know 10 qubits. Maybe we need more for some machines. How much overhead will this be? But we have to concentrate on that. Um, and I'm out of time. OK. You can't clone a quantum. And I did not get to the QKD. But we'll hear that. OK, we'll great. More about that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm going to deputize myself. What I'm hoping is, is that after Aaron's time for some questions for, um, before we go to our first panel, which I think now probably we'll try to get that first panel going by, by 1020, I think is probably a realistic expectations on that. But I did have one question for you real quick, and that is that right now most of the discussion you see about quantum computers, the, the advent of these, these super fast computers that quantum, quantum qubits will make possible, you see this in, in opposition to or in juxtaposition with classical computing and with the world of information technology has evolved from Bob Noyce until today. I mean, Noyce's example of, the, you know, of, of what had happened, the semiconductor was powered by, literally powered by, Moore's Law. And now we're seeing Moore's Law slowing down, breaking down. That to a degree, what you could say, can you, is that quantum computing will now come to the rescue of information technology based on, that has been based on classical principles, because they really don't have that much further that they can go. That's a, that's a uh, all right, thank you. Okay. Very good question. So you're asking me if I would see into the future with all the universal quantum computer into place, does the Moore's law, does quantum computing blow that away? Or is there overhead with this quantum error correction and we stay on Moore's law? Yeah. Great question. I would bet on blowing it away. But anyway, but uh, the panelists will talk about that. But there are, uh, we, we, we have more work to do. Great. Thank you. A keynote speaker. I was very pleased, very pleased when we got Aaron Van de Vender to agree to be our keynote speaker uh, because we knew that in addition to being a real headline speaker, like, like uh, Warner Miller, uh, that he would bring not just an understanding of the quantum field and of the new breakthroughs that have come and are coming in the field of quantum computing, not just understand it from a scientific point of view or in in understand it simply from a business point of view, but also from the point of view of the institution that he works for, and that is the fabled Founders Fund, the venture capital firm put together by Peter Thiel, among others, um, in order to begin to develop 
ways in which to 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 shape investment future investment in the areas of high tech in the areas of information technology and so on and that that aaron would bring to us in our discussion here for the course of our day some views on the way in which not only how the business models that that are evolving the new business models that are evolving through quantum computing quantum cyber security but also where the future lies the future lies in terms of in terms of where the money is going to go and where the future lies uh within these technologies as part of as part of a larger as part of a larger framework beyond simply simply the industry itself now aaron vandevender is the scientist in residence at the founders fund uh, he monitors the scientific impact of the portfolio works with portfolio companies assesses new technologies and conducts his own research and he can do this because he's got a very firm background and a very firm expertise in this area he's designed single photo photon and single atom quantum computers in academia and at government with the national institute of science and technology as a matter of fact uh, advanced the quantum mechanical theory for microscopic black holes patented the fastest transparent optical switch and is a co-inventor of Yocto Technology. Am I pronouncing that correct? Yocto Technology, which is named after the smallest unit prefix in the SI scale. The SI scale is what we used to call the uh, used to call uh, degrees Kelvin. He then developed next generation DNA sequencing technology at, at Halcyon Molecular. And his scientific interests encompass energy, which is one of the areas that I work in, uh, biotech, nanotech, and computing, particularly quantum computing. He received an SB from MIT and a PhD in physics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And in addition to his interest in entrepreneurial science, Aaron, I would point out, is also a professional skydiver. And he has agreed to stay after the conference to go out to Andrews Air Force Base and to give lessons for anyone who's interested in skydiving here for today. No, I, I actually made that part up. He didn't, he hasn't agreed to do that. But anyway, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to have with us Aaron Van de Vender. All right, thank you very much, Arthur. It's very, very warm welcome. Um, very privileged to be speaking to you this morning. Uh, let's see, are my slides available? Great, here we go. Uh, so I'd like to be talking about uh, secrets, magic, and quantum computing, sort of three of the big resources that uh, we use to drive uh, a, a lot of the value uh, in our society. So the first time that I heard about quantum computing, the idea of quantum computing, it's 20 plus years ago, and it, it really struck me as the closest thing that we could come to, to a science fiction-like technology uh, to be made real. And, and, and when I think about science fiction, more than being just about the future or being about space or being about uh, 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 science as research, it's really about how big ideas can impact and transform society, impact civilization. Um, and so quantum computing is one of the few things that really has that ability to have a large scale impact uh, on, on civilization. And so if we're gonna be thinking about quantum computing in science fiction sort of terms, um, I'd like to, to, to get a quote from Arthur C. Clarke, one of the great science fiction authors uh, who had three laws, but the third of which is the most, most well known, any sufficiently advanced technology be, is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, which provides great insight on what it must be like to, say, be a medieval person exposed to iPhones and 21st century technology and, and, and have no way to distinguish that from magic must seem pretty amazing. But actually, I'm going to say that this is wrong, that there is something very important that distinguishes magic and technology that Arthur C. Clarke missed. And, and to demonstrate that, first let's talk about a couple of examples of, of what we agree on as magic. Um, so Luke Skywalker... The Star Wars universe uh, uses the Force, which is very clearly a magical, a magical power. Uh, in, in, in this example, he's trying to raise his X-wing fighter out of the swamp under the tutelage of Yoda, and his ability in order to accomplish this feat 
is strongly correlated to his belief in the force and that he uses the power of that belief to, uh, to, to conduct this action. Um, we also have the elf uh, coming down from the North Pole trying to save Christmas. Uh, Santa has a sleigh that has this, uh, this jet engine, but instead of being powered by kerosene or rocket fuel, it's powered by the belief in the Christmas spirit. Uh, and so the elf's job is to make sure that enough New Yorkers believe in the Christmas spirit to power Santa's sleigh and so he can deliver all the presents. Uh, and, and then the best example of, of, of magic that I always come back to is that, of course, of Tinkerbell, uh, who can only fly if enough people believe in fairies. Uh, so who here believes in fairies? Everyone clap, clap if you believe in fairies. Okay, great, great. Uh, so the belief in fairies and, and expressing that through clapping drives the pixie dust uh, to have this, to give her this magical ability. And so, so the thing that we see that distinguishes magic from technology is that it is powered by belief. You need core beliefs in order to, to make the magic work and, and something that's not true for, for real technology. Uh, so cryptography, one of the basic technologies or, or tools that we have in our society, though, by this definition, is actually magic. It is not pure technology. That it requires belief in order for it to perform the function that, uh, that, that, that we use from it. Um, so RSA, public cryptography, was invented by uh, Vest Shamir Ailman in 1977 in, uh, uh, at MIT. And they were playing with one-way functions from number theory, uh, using prime numbers to uh, create functions um, uh, where you have where you could separate the encryption key from the decryption key, uh, and realized that that this sort of scheme had lots of really great benefits uh, for sharing secrets. So they got real excited about it, um, uh, patented, and then after uh, uh, playing with it, realized that it had many other benefits, including not just sharing secrets, but also uh, digital signatures and creating trust networks and, uh, uh, and and all these other things, but that the core uh, the core driving piece of it is that it, it's based on an unproven mathematical conjecture that large numbers are hard to factor into their primes, and there's no proof for this, uh, but everyone believes it to be true. But but that's sort of the essential element is that this belief that it is. Uh, that it is a difficult thing. And if for some reason we were to stop believing that, then all of the tangible benefits that we derive from RSA, public key cryptography, would, would vaporize. Uh, so you can think of cryptography uh, as a, a sort of machine that takes in the belief of the difficulty of this problem and turns it into security, turns it into trust, turns it into uh, authentic transactions and relationships and the things that we derive tangible benefits from. But if something comes along that were to dispel that belief, then the, the whole edifice of public key cryptography would crumble. The, the math would still work. All of our computers would still be performing those calculations, but all of the tangible benefits that we derive from it would suddenly evaporate. Because as, if you can't trust the system, if you can't believe that large numbers are hard to factor, that these problems are computationally insolvable, uh, then we would no longer be able to invest those resources into, into building up that, that infrastructure. Which, if you think about it, is a sort of a, a kind of crazy paradigm to have a technology that works and works very well, and we get lots of benefits from it, and then a new technology comes out that not just obsoletes it, but makes the old technology stop working. It would be sort of like Thomas Edison invents a light bulb, works for 100 years, lights up our homes, uh, and then one day someone invents an LED light bulb and you walk into a room and you flip a light switch and it doesn't work anymore. And, it, and, and the reason it's not working is because we just stopped believing in light bulbs now that, that, that LEDs exist. Fortunately, light bulbs are not magic. Uh, they are just technology, so we don't have to worry about, uh, about them stopping working just because something better comes along. Um, but that is the risk when you build things based on magic and not based on pure technology. So the magic that we have, however, provides us lots of really great benefits. Uh, it was primarily designed to drive secret sharing, uh, as, as cryptography systems uh, are useful for, going back to Caesar using rotational codes to communicate with uh, his generals, um, to the Enigma machine in World War II, uh, and the ability to communicate securely and preserve secrecy has been extremely valuable 
and a lot of work has, has sort of been driving most of the work in, um, in encryption over the years. However, uh, I would say that actually this is the secondary benefit that we get from it. The ability to communicate secretly at this stage is less important than some of the other features that we get from cryptography. And the, the most important one is the trust. Uh, being able to establish trusted relationships and have trusted and authentic communications with, uh, with, with people out in the world and out on the internet is actually more valuable to society, more valuable to the internet than, uh, than just being able to, to do things secretly. Um, most of the quantum cryptography and classical cryptography models, though, are sort of stuck in the old way of thinking about things that are very secrecy-centric instead of trust-centric. And so they always start out with uh, this, this idea of Alice and Bob, where you have uh, two parties who are trying to communicate with each other secretly, um, and then there's a third eavesdropper named Eve who is trying to listen, listen in. And, and my, my caution is to be wary when this model comes up, because it is, uh, it is sort of overly simplistic and doesn't capture all of the nuance and value of the, the relationships and transactions and communications that we really want to have. So if we expend our resources just trying to provide or rebuild uh, the existing Alice and Bob model, then we will come up with a technology platform that is insufficient uh, 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 for our needs, that, that doesn't actually give us all of, the, all of the things that we expect from the cryptography systems that we have now. Um, and that it's just, it's just too limiting. There's too many assumptions like, okay, I can have a, an, uh, a, a classical and a quantum communication channel between, these, uh, between Alice and Bob, uh, but they're already authenticated. And so the trust relationship here is implicit. I don't actually have to solve for that using my quantum systems. And so that's something that we're going to need to address as we develop these architectures in the future. Uh, digital signatures are the, the basis of that trust. The, 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 they're the tool that we get from public key cryptography that allows us to have software updates that, uh, that come onto our phones and make sure we don't have malware, they were, where the Apple Store is signing each of the apps as before they get pushed into your phone, and so they can be authenticated. Uh, and, and we know that uh, the, the, the software that we're running is authentic. It is what it says it is. If you think about the mode of distribution there is a broadcast mode. It's not a one-to-one -one Alice and Bob uh, kind of thing, it's one to many. It's, it's the Apple store to the world. We don't care about preserving secrecy in that relationship because it's being broadcast to everyone. It's, a, you know, it's publicly distributed. But what we do care about is that it's authentic. That if, something, if someone tries to intervene, then there is not an opportunity for them to, uh, to inject something corrupt. So all of that infrastructure, all of that artifice of cryptography and the public infrastructure ends up uh, in this green lock icon, which is, it seems like a very, you know, it only takes a handful of pixels on our, on our screen, but actually an enormous amount of infrastructure goes into making that little lock. Uh, but what I want to remind everyone is that this lock is not technology, it is actually magic. Uh, it, is, it is based on that artifice. The fact that we allow ourselves to, you know, to send money to people, to transact with our banks, uh, to transact with our loved ones, uh, and that we put trust and we invest resources into it is all based on this, uh, our belief that large numbers are hard to factor into the prime. And so if we stop believing that or if something challenges that, uh, then this green lock no longer works. It, it doesn't allow us to keep investing those resources into it anymore. And so we, we have to protect that. Uh, so um, uh, as Dr. Miller pointed out, uh, Richard Feynman, one of the inventors and, and forefathers of quantum computing, uh, came up with his idea and noticed that we were getting a lot of benefit by using computers to model the physical universe, uh, which works really great for classical physics, for doing um, Monte Carlo simulations and for solving systems of equations. But fundamentally, if you want to model the quantum mechanical universe, you're going to need a quantum mechanical computer, that a regular computer is just doesn't have the, the complexity to model the, the quantum mechanical universe. And so if you could build a quantum mechanical system that you could control with the same degree of flexibility that you could control a regular computer, you could use that to model other quantum systems uh, and learn things about the, the quantum mechanical universe. 
So there there have been a lot of debates uh, recently about whether or not the universe that we are living in is a simulation or not. Uh, and people say things with sound with very high sounding conviction. Uh, and I but I, I will don't think that there's any way to really know whether we're living in a base universe or a simulation. But I will say that if we are living in a simulation, the computer that it's running on is definitely a quantum computer, right? Which might tell us that the universe, the, that, that, uh, that the, the actual base universe has quantum physics that is very similar to our own and that it can pass through onto the quantum simulation that we are running on. Um, be that as it may, the quantum simulation or the quantum universe that we are in uh, 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 lets us do some pretty amazing things. So, uh, so Peter Shore developed this algorithm uh, in 1994 and it allows a quantum computer as sort of described by Feynman to be able to factor large numbers into their primes. And so it sort of challenges that belief uh, uh, that our cryptography systems are based on. And it does this by transforming a factoring problem into a periodicity problem by looking for um, if, you have a, if you have a wave or you have a signal, how often does it repeat? And, and that sort of kind of wave kind of question is something that, that quantum computers are very good at answering. And so it came up with this algorithm that uh, can exponentially faster answer those kinds of questions than a classical computer can. Um, and so although this was the first quantum algorithm uh, to really be proposed or be written, it will probably be one of the last ones to be run. And that as we are developing quantum computers and now they have a handful of bits and we expect that to, uh, to grow as we develop the te technology and scale it more, the size of quantum computer that you need to solve the factoring problem is still quite large, uh, even by quantum computer standards, uh, even though it's exponentially faster than a classical computer. So the expectation is that we will run sort of quantum simulations, quantum chemistry, some of the other algorithms first on smaller quantum computers as they build up, but eventually we will get to that place where an, uh, an, an RSA size key uh, is able to be factored by a quantum computer. And so that's, that's, sort of, that's, uh, that's where we are heading. So that sort of tells us that quantum mechanics is a little bit like alcohol in this sense, and that it is both the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. Uh, it creates a lot of difficulty for us in that we've built this public key infrastructure on the internet Quantum mechanics comes along and smashes that, but it also gives us a lot of really great tools for building new systems that allow us to have secret and authentic communications uh, with each other and with people in the public and on the internet. Um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, they look very different and have very different properties. And so as we make that transition, we have to keep uh, some of those things in mind. So one of the first technologies that we were able to develop that used the quantum properties to give us some of the benefits of public key cryptography, uh, although in a very different mode, is quantum key distribution as developed by um, folks like Charles Bennett, uh, uh, Giles Bassard, Arthur Eckert, uh, several other folks. It's very great for secrecy in that it, uh, the, the, the guarantees that it makes about having a communication between two folks, as long as you, know, you sort of follow the rules of the protocol, are absolute. There are no unproven mathematical conjectures at the heart of quantum key distribution the way that there are at the heart of RSA. That it only relies on derivable math and experimentally verified physics, and there's nothing else in there. Uh, so, we, which we feel very secure about. So, well, so we, would quant we would classify quantum key distribution as not magic, that it is definitely in the technology, uh, technology category. So it's really great for secrecy. The problem is that it's kind of difficult for trust. So quantum mechanics, fundamentally, has some uh, very unique features uh, that, uh, that, that make it great for secrecy, including the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, which says that you can't measure both the position and the momentum of a particle uh, at, at the same time. And so it's, it sort of tells us that the universe is very good at keeping secrets, that quantum mechanics puts fundamental limits on what is knowable in the universe. And so those limits are usable, are leverageable by us in designing protocols to keep secrets from other folks. Um, uh, 
And so that gives us a very, very strong kind of guarantee when we are exchanging secrets with each other because we have the universe at our back. We're using the universal mechanisms, the quantum mechanical mechanisms for, for secret keeping in our favor. Uh, on the other hand, though, quantum mechanics also has a principle called the no cloning theorem. The no cloning theorem states that quantum states can't be copied. So unlike, say, if I write a number down on a piece of paper and I hand it to you, uh, it's very easy for you to copy that number onto another piece of paper and go and distribute it. But in quantum mechanics, that's not possible. If I hand you a quantum state, a fully coherent quantum state, it is not possible to make an exact copy of that without destroying uh, the first one. And so that prevents a lot of the normal modalities of communication that we are used to. Uh, the sort of one-to-many kinds of, kinds of modalities where being able to copy and distribute information is so, is so core to, uh, uh, to how we do things like digital signal distribution and public key infrastructures. And so those kinds of architectures can't be applied to quantum protocols because the no cloning theorem prevents those quantum states from being copied. Uh, in fact, just this week, uh, the, there was a, f a flaw found in the WPA2 protocol, which is the, the sort of normal authentication, enterprise level authentication that, that, our, that, wi -Fi, that all of our Wi-Fi devices use. And the way the attack works is a key replay attack. So during the handshake process, the, uh, an attacker can, can, um, can replay the key during the protocol and, uh, and, and cause, a state, cause the key to be, to be um, uh, loaded into a known state. If we were using quantum Wi-Fi, this would not be a problem. The key replay tax would be, would be ruled out because of the no cloning theorem. So it's great for that kind of like secrecy, but it causes problems for some of the, some of the trust. Um, when we're trying to build this, the, the public key infrastructure that we have, where we have, uh, where we have registrars signing signatures, and so when you know that I go to a website and I create a relationship with a new person that I've never transacted with before. Um, this is very, a very difficult thing to do because of the, the with, with the no cloning theorem, and that prevents the kind of distributing of the quantum states. If I try and engineer my way around that by just creating many copies of the quantum state and distributing uh, those myself, then uh, an attacker can go and collect all those up and use algorithms like uh, quantum state estimation and quantum te uh, tomography and sort of um, negate a lot of the benefits that I had from, the, from, from, from making this be a quantum protocol from the begin with. So those things are sort of at odds with each other, and so we have to be extra clever about how we design our trust infrastructure. Another interesting feature that quantum computing has, uh, that and the quantum mechanics has, that we have to keep in mind as we are developing our, our new secrecy and trust infrastructures is this idea that it is reversible that unlike in, say, a normal computer, if I have some input and I have some output, and I know what the steps were, um, that, uh, that with a quantum algorithm, if I know the steps and I know the output, I can always run the steps back in time to get the input. Uh, that there has this sort of time reversal symmetry sort of property, which doesn't really, which we, which we don't see in, in classical computing. In fact, um, you can kind of think of it like a Rubik's cube where all of my quantum computations are simple rotations. I can represent them as rotations in some very large dimensional space. And so if I start with a Rubik's Cube that's jumbled up, and I do some rotations to it, and I solve it, and I give it to someone, and I tell them what the rotations were, they can just undo each of them one by one and hand it back to me, and, and I will have the same jumbled state that I started with, uh, which is not possible with just a regular, uh, with regular classical computer program. And in fact, the fact that it's not possible is something we rely on in cryptography, where we have one-way functions. We have uh, hash functions that are fully avalanched. All the, all the bits depend on the other bits, but it's computationally impossible to go backwards, even if I know what all the steps that were taken were, and I know uh, what all of the, what, what the out steps were. Because in classical information, in, in classical computing, information gets erased along the way. Uh, it gets uh, thrown off as heat. Uh, and in quantum computation, that doesn't happen. There's sort of nothing wasted, so it's very efficient. But at the same time, if I'm if I'm using uh, that that heat, that 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 erasure as as part of the 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 benefit of my algorithm, then it's it's not going to show up. So I have to be aware that when I'm designing my system, I can't just simply 
upgrade the algorithms I already have into the quantum world because doing so would make them reversible and therefore not useful for the same kinds of quantum primitives that, that we're accustomed to. So one of the ways that this really shows up is with uh, the Bitcoin network. Um, we are already deriving a huge amount of, of tangible benefits from being able to transact and have uh, exchanges of value with people on the internet with no trusted third parties. Uh, but uh, the protocol was designed on classical computation, on, uh, on uh, public key infrastructure as we understand it today, and has some features that we need to be aware of. So the mining of new coins of Bitcoin is based on SHA-256 hash algorithm. This turns out actually to be vulnerable by a quantum algorithm called Grover's algorithm. However, it doesn't give us an exponential speed up. It's only a quadratic speed up. So it's probably not the, not the fundamental vulnerability uh, for, the, uh, for the Bitcoin network from quantum computing. However, the Bitcoin transactions, if I move something from one account to another account or one address to another address, those are signed, those are authenticated with RSA public key keys. Uh, and so once I, once I move money from one account to another, then someone, an attacker, could see that transaction, get my private key, and then all of the remaining money in that account would then be vulnerable. They could, they could come and, and, and make a new transaction and steal it. So I could imagine perhaps uh, uh, sort of engineering myself around this where I, although Bitcoin itself, as we understand it now, is definitely magic, we sort of have a reduced magic version of it where maybe I, I only use each one of my private keys once and then move everything to, to a new address. And so even if someone figures out my private key later, because uh, the quantum computer is, it just takes a little bit of time, they, uh, they, they won't be able to make use of that. It, it would be a very cumbersome system. It would be like every time you go to the ATM and you withdraw $20, you would have to close your account and move all of your, your money to a, to a new account. So no one, would, you know, what, so because that, that account would be vulnerable from then on. So you, you could, you could kind of figure out a way to do it. But a much better approach would be to sort of just table the, the architecture that we have now for Bitcoin and think about how should we be really moving money around if instead of trying to fight against the quantum principles and fight against what the quantum computer represents, actually use the quantum principles in our favor. And so that's this idea of, of quantum money. Um, this was actually sort of first proposed uh, um, uh, by, by Steven Weisner in the 70s, perhaps maybe the first real quantum algorithm or, or study in quantum information um, uh, before anybody took any of this seriously or really had any idea that any, any of this was really possible as a sort of thought experiment that what if you could use things like the no cloning theorem to provide counterfeit protection for your money? So, so then instead of fighting against the, the quantum properties and, the, and fighting against the quantum computer, we now have quantum mechanics working for us, where we say uh, the, that if I'm printing my money, then the no cloning theorem prevents anyone else from stealing it or from, for, prevents anyone else from copying it. And so now we have to figure out to develop protocols of what's the best way to validate that the money that I have is really authentic, but knowing that the safety and security of it is backed by quantum physics. And so this is, this is something that exciting that we have to look forward to and that we can have a money exchanging system on the internet that is extremely secure and maybe more importantly, that is not magic, that is just based on real technology, on physics and, and, and derived uh, math. Um, so in the post-quantum post world, uh, it is still going to be useful if for a while for us to develop algorithms and systems that have some of the features and benefits of, of things like RSA that give us secrecy and trust, but are maybe not as vulnerable to quantum attacks, to quantum computers. Uh, lots of proposals for these things out there. Uh, lattice codes, error correcting codes, multivariate codes. I would like to point out, however, that even though there are no known quantum algorithms uh, that can solve these things, although Peter Shore and others are working very hard to try and change that, that all of these things are still magic, that they are still based on unproven conjectures, that, these, that certain problems are very difficult uh, to go one way uh, that more than they are the other. And so there's still that, there's still that risk. Uh, while we're in this transition zone, it's still to keep cognizant in mind that 
new algorithms can come along, new algorithms uh, will be developed, the quantum computers will get much bigger, much faster. Um, and so as we are looking to build the, the trust and communication and security networks of the future, we should be trying to, to you know, at least go to stronger versions of magic, but ideally move off of magic and, and start using real technology. Um, so this is uh, uh, a sketch from Isaac Newton's um, uh, notebooks about the Philosopher's Stone, which was sort of the, the core piece of magic behind alchemy. He gave it a shot, uh, played around with it, maybe learned some things about chemistry in the process, but eventually had to give it up. Uh, and, and it sort of points to that perhaps that a lot of these things that we're basing our cryptography systems are that are magic live in the kind of Goodell's incompleteness theorem, uh, which says that there are, must be things in math that are true but not provable. Unfortunately, we never really know what those things are, so it's hard to kind of count on them. Um, but the, the idea is that, we're, this, that's, that Newton went through this transition period of, of looking at magic and exploring it and learned a lot of things from there, but eventually moved off of that and, and, got, and got into real science. And so I hope that, uh, that, that, that we can make a similar transition. Uh, we've rubbed the lamp, we, we made some wishes, we got some really great benefits out of uh, public key cryptography. Um, but now that quantum computers are, are, are starting to become a, a real possibility, that we need to be cognizant of that and how we build our system. So uh, I'm going to end back where I started with Arthur C. Clarke. Um, so we started with his third law. This one is his second, uh, which I think is probably a little bit more true. Uh, so the only way of uh, discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. It's Arthur C. Clarke's second law. And so that's what I'd like us to do here today, and looking forward to that, is a little bit past what we think the impossible is with, uh, with, with, with developing quantum computers and, and, and figure out where that boundary is. So thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I think, we, I think we, it's worth taking some questions, don't you? Uh, we're gonna, we'll do our... First panel, then we'll just bump it up to a 10:30 start. Um, I'm going to take the privilege of asking the first one, though, and that is what I find fascinating about your discussion is that if we're going to be talking about a a, uh, a post quantum cryptography era, and then and then a quantum driven cryptography era, that what you're going to have is a situation in which the belief in the impregnability of the old system is going to be destroyed by the appearance of the quantum computer, which can crack those, un, those unprovably uh, impossible to solve problems. It's going to shatter the sense of trust and belief in the old RSA-based encryption system. But then comes a new challenge, which is to build a sense of trust in belief in a uh, in, in the QKD based system as well, because institutions that you go to, you just sort of said your cryptography system is now trash. Uh, it's now it's now gone and blown away. And they're going to say, and you're telling me you've got a system now that's better when you just told me my old system, which I rested on for all these years, is is no good. And what you're suggesting is is it's not just a question then about science or engineering. Or even 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 uh, building great algorithms, it's also an informational, even a public relations issue, which says now you'll have a system you can really trust going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's I would I would think it's good to keep in mind that the transition doesn't happen all at once, and that it's always good to think about it in in economic terms. So you have a sort of threat model of of who you're trying to defend against. So at the beginning, quantum computers are going to be uh, right now, they don't exist at that scale that we know of, um, but eventually they will. But at first, they will be just uh, like kind of state actor level enterprises, where it'll cost billion, multi-billion dollar uh, uh, pieces of engineering in order to make that work. And so, if you are trying to defend against that level of attacker, there's probably other things you need to worry about besides a quantum computer coming along. And so. Uh, from just you know your people being arrested, usually like the, the sort of human vectors of attack are the most vulnerable, 
Uh, and so making sure that those are secure relative to a state level actor uh, is first. And then as the cost of quantum computing comes down and it becomes more acceptable, accessible to lower and lower levels of attackers, then you, you, then you sort of get to the point where you, can, you will need to transition off of that onto uh, like a quantum key distribution kinds of architectures. And so, so for each individual application, keeping in mind the threat level and saying, okay, we are now, right now the price is infinity. Uh, and saying like, but you know, if, as long as a quantum computer is more than $10 billion, but the thing that I'm protecting is worth less than that, and so it's okay, if I can still wait a little bit maybe to, to move off of it. But once the cost of the quantum computer is cheaper than the value of the attack, then it's time to move. I'm gonna take a couple of questions and then we're gonna set up our first panel. And I'll take the question here, the gentleman there. Us, when you were, yeah. Why don't you use the microphone if you can just better. identify yourself and your affiliation um, and also my team will be very happy with me if I just remind you that cell phones should be on mute from this point on as well. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tanner Johnson. I'm a, I'm a senior research analyst with uh, Jane's by IHS Market um, doing some substantial research in uh, cybersecurity uh, efforts and as you mentioned Bitcoin I was curious about your your take on the blockchain has trust inherent and built into the system, and so it doesn't require the belief component, not necessarily. So would there be something such as a quantum blockchain that, that, that has that level of trust built in automatically that uh, doesn't require prior communication, prior uh, relationship development ahead of time? Yes, so, uh, so th I would say that that's what we want to get to. We want, we want to have a... A, a network that is similar to Bitcoin in that it allows people to transact with no trusted third parties, but it only relies on experimental physics, on quantum physics and math, and not on any of these unproven conjectures about prime numbers. And so we're not really there yet, but it's definitely something that uh, is an active area of research that, that people are thinking about. But um, the, the part of that question is like, uh, what are in order to do that? What are the computational resources that you would take? What does it What does it take to be a node on the quantum Bitcoin network? And we we don't know that yet. Uh, we it, it might be like a, with a QKD system where that where actually the requirements are very low. I don't need a general purpose quantum computer to just exchange quantum key distribution type secrecy. Uh, but maybe for a quantum Bitcoin network, I do. Or like the bar is a little bit higher. So we're still trying to figure that out of exactly what are the resources required to make that work. Um, it's an active area of research, and, and, and you know, we'll look forward to how it goes. But what we can say right now is that it is going to have some features that are somewhat different, that it's not going to be a straightforward upgrade from just the Bitcoin to quantum Bitcoin, uh, because some of the features of quantum mechanics are incompatible with the way that, that, that public, key, public key photography systems work today. And then we have a question here. Hi, I'm Charles Harvey with uh, American Defense International. I have a question on, you know, the Founders Fund is known for investing right at the edge of magic. In the quantum realm, what have you turned down in the quantum area for investment, and what types of quantum investments would you all look at pursuing? Yeah, so uh, we turned down a lot of things. Um, <laughs> uh, and I would say that the way that we... The way that it's, it's hard to get into specifics on this one, but let me characterize it for you. Uh, the way that we see it is that when things are purely in the sort of research phase, that they feel very expansionary. That as we do more research and we answer questions, each new result we get inspires two or three more questions. So the number of questions that you have altogether, the sort of space of possibilities that you're operating in, it continues to expand, maybe even exponentially. And then at some point, you reach an inflection point where now, as you are uh, as you are answering questions, instead of adding branches to your tree of possibilities, you are pruning them, and things are starting to converge. And so, where we like to invest is right around that inflection point, where we say, "Okay, we've mapped out now what the space of possibilities are. We can sort of look down the road and see where the future is. We're we're probably not adding too many more branches now, and we're really starting to prune them so we can code and converge on." Uh, an, an actual executable emergent technology that, that we think can have an impact. Okay, I'm going to squeeze in one more and then we really want to move on to the next panel. 
Thank you very much. Paul Joyle, uh, NSI. I'd like to ask you if, if you've thought to the edge of the use of quantum uh, for the applications of C cubed I battlefield communications on the defensive side and on the offensive side, electronic warfare. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. So I would say that um, we have thought a lot about that and for the battlefield. We, we think that being able to support quantum, quantum communications uh, via satellite links is a, a very important part of that. Um, and so thinking about how would you build a quantum communications infrastructure that can be space-based, uh, which is very difficult because in order for in order for you to have transparent quantum links through a satellite, you need to be able to transmit single photons. So be able to, with high fidelity, transmit one photon and reliably have it received you know, from the satellite and then to the other side, wherever the destination is, and go through all of the atmosphere, worry about interference from the sun, uh, which is you know, putting out 10 to the 14 sorts of photons kinds of things. Um, and so the signal to noise problems are extremely difficult. But uh, the benefits of doing that, of having that level of sensitivity that gets you something that is not spoofable and not jammable, we think is, 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 would be super important for, for, for those applications. And offensive electronic warfare. Um, I, don't, I, don't think we have a, I don't think we have any particular, particular take on that. It's most of the benefits that you get from uh, making something quantum and the, the and overcoming the challenges of that, of that are more on the defensive side. I want to thank both of our speakers for a wonderful presentation. And now our first panel with Dr. Chris Monroe, uh, with uh, Arif Karim, Michael Brett, and Dr. Martin LaForest. If you guys can come up and, and we can get started.